Welcome back to Wild Speculations. I'm Daniel. I'm Scott. Tonight we are talking about Critical Role Campaign 3, Episode 39, The Momentum of Murder. An interesting title. Yeah. Um, and Matt sort of made the point in a roundabout way. Uh, you know, this is the third person they've said goodbye to in this house. Um, and now two murders have spurned them on to bigger and better things. <laughs> um, Nothing brings the team together like killing someone. True. Whether it's Estros or Bertrand or Coulson or whoever. Yeah. They needed the push. Um, we begin with a debate to report or not to report. Uh, and also going over the letters. Um, and uh, that there's a recipe. And Travis Chetney is like, maybe there's a code. Uh, not on a Unre uh, unreasonable leap to make, considering he and his wife were both in Full Metal Alchemist. Yeah. Where the ingredients for a Philosopher's Stone are detailed in a cookbook. Right. And I didn't remember that they were in it, but I thought of that episode. Oh. <laughs> I thought about that arc when I watched the show. Right on. <laughs> so, even without remembering they were in it, my mind made that leap to Full Metal Alchemist. Um, yeah. Ashton, ever the, uh, experienced criminal amongst them, is like, we're going to be the first primary sucks best guys. Yeah. It's just, uh, and then of course he's proven correct. Well, yeah. You, you don't need a crystal ball to predict the obvious. Yeah. Uh, they debate sending to Evelyn, Estros's valet. Yes. I think is probably the best title for her. Probably. Um, and I think they're looking at, uh, being informed of something by sending as the equivalent of being told about something over the phone. Yeah. Or via email or whatever. In a D&D &D world, the sending spell is sort of someone praying for you to hear them, and they hear you. Like, from a cleric perspective, they are praying to gods to carry your words to a person. Yes. From an arcanist's point of view, they understand the threads that tie people together, and those are the wit threads that they are manipulating to send this message. But either way, not everyone can do it, and it's a voice from the ether delivering you information. I think it has a little more powerful, a little more power than a phone call. I mean, I know the numbers to several people. I can reach out and contact them, to at least in line with their arcana's perspective. Yeah. Although, with what you're saying, it's really astounding that in more D and D worlds there aren't like airplane cults popping up over wizards who have sent messages to Oh, I'm hearing voice I mean hearing voices oh, yeah. is how religions get started. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh and there's also 
uh, I keep thinking about. And now I want an evil wizard to have become a god to the tribe of people. <laughs> so, here's another example, and this is a niche movie, so people might not get it, but Real Genius. Mm -hmm. 1986, I think. Uh, Val Kilmer. One of the pranks that they do to the teacher's pet bully is wire his braces yes. to receive radio signals and transmit them and they pretend they're God talking to him. Yes. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> Just saying, I'm surprised there's not more of that in D&D worlds. <laughs> but I keep going back to like uh, telegraph offices okay. and sending stones. And, like, if everyone at home has a sending stone that's paired with something at this telegraph office, the operator, then they can basically receive on this sending stone, slot it here, take this sending stone, slot it here, and now you've connected two different people. Oh, okay. And basically that would be your arcane D&D telephone system. I would almost see that as, yeah, like TTY, where you talk to an operator, and then they type the message for a deaf person, but in mm. this case it would just be you talk to an operator, they say verbatim what you said, that person talks to the they say yeah. verbatim what they said. Yeah. But a, a machine that could, like, whatever is said to this sending stone, is spoken right into right. that one and sent. Yeah. Although it might be fun to have a cadre of Kenku that act as operators. Yeah. So that they do, they are hearing and repeating verbatim, verbatim. in that person's voice. Yeah. And. Interesting. Um, there is a bit of confrontation with Marisha over. They called you Matilda. Um, and we both said that uh, it would probably be uh, early in the episode. Yeah. That they would confront her about it. Oh, yeah. Um, and when and I love Ashen's protective nature kicking in. Well, I, I would have done it more gently than that. But, you know, like, come on, guys. To be nice to the girl I like. Yeah. <laughs> There's also a little bit of Andre the Giant in uh, Princess Bride protecting Wesley when. Yeah. Uh, and he goes like, you know, do, bombarding him with questions. He's like, he's had a hard day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jiggle's supposed to make you happy. Uh. It's progress. And basically it was just she kind of forgot her name. Yeah. And found Ladna and liked it. So that's what she calls herself now. Yeah. Um, do you think she will ever reclaim Matilda Bradbury? Or do you think, from her perspective, that person is dead? No, I, I think Matilda Bradbury is dead. Okay. I tend to agree with you, I think. Um, I think by the end of things, the only ones that I'll call her Matilda would be Imogen. Maybe Ashton. Ashton won't. For sure yeah. won't. Because um, choosing your identity is okay, is very big to him. Yeah. Um, and I don't think Imogen will unless Laudna asks her to. Yeah. Or, no, I think, I think it would have to be she that makes the ask. Um, but I think 
like when Imogen reads Ladna's thoughts or sort of addresses her mentally, I think she does get I am Ladna. There was there's never been a pretense about lying about her name or yeah. concealing a name. Uh, I think it's just who she is. Um, which is interesting. Um, we have confirmation. None of the items that Fern collected in uh, Nega Whitestone yeah. came back with them. Um, I think it's funny and very much in keeping with it taking five days, six days for that to come up with how often Ashley plays it off that she just finds stuff in her fur, doesn't remember where it came from. Yeah. <laughs> or when someone asks, hey, you have this, she doesn't know where it is. Well, I mean, Kendra's going to Kendra. Yeah. Uh, we also get confirmation quickly that she retained her powers. Yep. But Matt absolutely refused to answer with any uh, definite language if uh, Delilah is gone forever. Well, why why would you at this juncture? Yeah. Um, the self-respecting DM would have answered with any degree of certainty. Yeah. Uh, about the only thing he could say is you don't feel her clutches upon you. Yeah. But that's not the same as she's gone. No. Not even close. Uh... So I'm interested to see if Matt uh, because it's almost an opposite arc maybe of Ford where Ford sort of was ignorant of the source of his powers and then it became revealed to him and then he began to resist the powers were taken away. Yeah. Laudna knows where her power her warlock powers come from, and already doesn't like it. Yeah. But the powers are useful. Uh, and Marisha herself said, I hadn't intended to take any extra levels of warlock at this point, but everything I've been doing, I've been using more warlock stuff than sorcerer stuff. Yeah. Um, so it will be interesting if at any point Matt does take her warlock powers away. But I don't think that's going to happen this campaign. I don't think so. I'm, I'm a little surprised because I thought for sure that they had switched her to the Sundry patron. Because at the end of that episode, um, the one I missed discussing with you, she goes through the dis this descriptive thing of taking her form of dread but instead of what it used to be, it was tree branches growing and withering and, you know, like a dead tree. And I was like, she, and she's doing that to the sun tree. The sun tree is her new patron. Dan called it. And that seems to have kind of been dropped this episode in favor of, you still have your powers. They seem to the exact same as when Delilah was present. I'm like, and they even questioned, well, what about your form of dread? And she's like, I don't know. I'm like, you described your form of dread. Well, and they, well, I don't think she wanted to frighten anyone, and Matt didn't make anyone make the check when she did it in Whitestone. Right. Um, so I don't know. Um, yeah, I was a little confused by that. And I don't think, so, there's a difference between flavor and mechanics. Yes. 
And I think Marisha has been playing a lot of her uh, powers coming from her being reborn. Not necessarily the warlock thing. Yeah. So, like her form of dread, yes, it's from her warlock, but it's sort of been connected to uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that, but uh, Stoopy, the Naked Sun Tree, and therefore still Delilah. I also, I don't know about that. Um, I'm still, I think it's going to be the Raven Queen. Yeah, but and um, Delilah even said that place wasn't hers. Yeah, it was London. So, I mean, she was using the sentry there, but it wasn't hers. Yeah. Um, can you be your own patron? Like your own patron? Uh, so you asked that question. Brennan Lee Mulligan did that. Oh yeah. In a Strixhaven game. Okay. He was like, I think I think he was a reborn uh, artificer, and the or artificer and uh, warlock, undead warlock, multi class, and he had a imp familiar that would bring him back to life because the his thing was he had gone forward he was doing some time traveling in the afterlife okay basically. And came back from the future and re-inhabited his dead body. Um, so I mean, that, that'd be interesting just to have someone who like be a be like a reborn and be like, I was a like powerful wizard in my past life, and now I'm pulling from that past life to power myself. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Interesting. All right, now I'm gonna go and make the character. <laughs> Um, they are unable to resist the temptation to open the sealed letters and another campaign of mail fraud. Yes, spending is a felon's cantrip. And now I know why I'm always drawn to it. <laughs> so, here's the interesting thing about that. I don't think it would work. Why? You could repair the wax, potentially, but not adhere it to the the paper, to the envelope. Well, if... Because they are two separate things. I don't know. Yes, but if you cut it so that part of the wax is on the base and part of the wax is still on the lip, and then mend the wax back together... Yeah. Then it's still sealed. Yes. Okay. It would require a sleight of hand check to open it correctly, and then the mending spell to seal it. Fair. Sure. But I, I it, it would definitely be a, more than just the mending spell, and you're in the clear. Yeah. But if you do it correctly, and you have those ranks in sleight of hand, and you have you know the proficiency and then you, I would say, yeah, go for it. Yeah, you got this. I just kept thinking, you know, one of them, hopefully Marisha, in the next campaign, their character has the surname Newman. <laughs> just, just so they can just have it out in the open. I have a wizard build that is a messenger. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll send it. <laughs> and we can just tweak it just a little bit to make him the occasional male fraudster. There you go. Uh, or you could just cut open the envelope and seal the envelope back together with Mindy. Yes. Yes. 
Um, we get the reappearance of the Green Seekers. Yes. Uh, in the employ of uh, Sifara. Sifari. Yeah. Um, I just want to say Estros, but that's um, Shashadre. Shashadre. Um, and they're like, you got to come with us because you're the primary suspects. Um, yep. You know, don't do anything stupid. Give us a minute. They're outside your window, too. You can't get out that way. <laughs> For half a second, I had a flash of uh, the Three Musketeers when uh, the Cardinal's guards come up on the three of them and D'Artagnan about to have their duels. Oh, yeah. Do you intend to come quietly or do you intend to resist? Of course we intend to resist. Just give us a minute, alright? <laughs> yes. <laughs> just a little, uh, just a tiny hint of that. In the, give us a minute, close the door. That would be out. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and an interesting reaction from FCG when the priestess of the Raven Queen is going to cast Speak with Dead on Estros. He's sort of horrified and is like, well, don't do that. Do you think they will? We will get an exploration of that reaction if we come across speak with Ned again. Because hmm. technically, FCG can cast it because there's a cleric spell. He hasn't chosen to, and I don't think he will. In and I, I, I agree. But so unless the need for it, either they come across someone else who does it, or there's a need for it and they ask him to do it. Well, that can excuse Okay. Until then, it's just going to be left in the wind. Because hmm. I think it probably has something to do with how he views uh, soul folk, isn't it? That's how he termed them, or something like that. Folk with souls. Yeah. Um, and because we haven't really dealt with FCG much around the dead Correct. and preparing them for whatever. We do know that Ashton helped him bury. Yeah. Or at least have a funeral of some kind for his companions. Uh, but I think that happened when they got back to Drusar. Yeah, and that, I don't know, that seemed more like the the therapist, the grieving process kind mm. of thing, rather than the Fate. cleric. Yeah. He's kind of not really been that. Yeah. Um, and on purpose. I mean... He, he went from his interaction with dead people was making them dead to his interaction with dead people and helping the living grieve. Yeah. So. Um, from Estros's mouth, it was Otahan. Yep. Not the people before them that killed him. So they're off the hook. And the priestess and Laudna have a a moment, uh, which is why I say in my notes that the Raven Queen's definitely going to be her patron at some point. Okay. Um, I don't think Matt introduces a character like that without the intent or expectation that they're going to be making another appearance. Yeah, I agree. Um, 
especially with your welcome back. And then everyone, oh, wow. It's interesting in that moment is Imogen tries to question her silently. Did you sense anything else? No, should I have? And Marisha trying to do an insight check at the at her back, basically. Um, I wonder if after the game there was some clarification made that she's unaware exactly what she was thinking, but that Laudna could read that Imogen was talking to her. Hmm. Because Laudna has been around Imogen talking into other people's heads before. Yeah. And the telltale signs of stopping looking around or different people will react different ways. Yeah. But she's had to have seen it enough that maybe, I mean, I think she certainly rolled high enough that at some point in the future she could say to Imogen, what did you ask her? But I don't know if that will happen. Because I think, despite the thank you for bringing me back and we're over the rock yeah. breaking, there's a little bit of that scar tissue, let's say that's always going to be, is this worth risking a rift again? Yeah. Because we've now experienced that rift. And Laudna doesn't exactly have healthy attachment uh, habits. So I think we will see from her going forward Avoiding all conflict with Imogen, even where it might be uh, necessary, and I think we might see Ashton stepping in. Yeah, if something like that's happening, yeah, where he sees that Imogen's doing something he doesn't like to or about Laudna, yeah, and she's not saying it, he will step in and be like, "Hey, yeah, we will see that." Um, but they deliver the letter that they skimmed and she just puts it in her pocket and Sam can't stand it <laughs> at least I'm pretty sure it's Sam yeah and FC aren't you going to read it like this dead guy wrote that to you like his last words. Aren't you interested? I'll read it later. What? <laughs> Which kind of makes me wonder, is Sam the only one of them that consistently cleans out his inbox? <laughs> or is he the one that doesn't? Because either of those could be true. Yeah. I'm going with the latter. Uh, shockingly, they admit they opened it. Yeah. And first step of criminal behavior, don't confess to your crimes. But I also like that Shashadre... In the moment, like, it doesn't look like it. 
yeah, you know, we've got skills. And then she's like, and oh, I understand why Estros trusted you now. Yeah. Because they did the same kind of thing to Estros too. Yeah. Where they admitted some shady shit that they were doing towards him. Um so yeah, it's I think that's interesting how that parallel uh this new contact uh had such a a, a mirror of Estros. Yeah. Um We get some discussion of uh, Paragon's Call and Otohana Thule specifically, her background yep. that is known, um, that, how she made her name. Uh, and I didn't catch it until prepping for the show tonight. But it was something in the way Matt described it. Uh, that made me, I was like, is this, is Paragon Call, Paragon's Call, like, the Wagner group that are fighting for Russia and Ukraine? She's collecting all these prisoners. Yeah. You know, they're, and they're doing all kinds of shady deals to get government contracts. Uh, and maybe she's fighting a conflict she can't win. Believes that she can. Uh, maybe I'm watching too much Ukraine war coverage. It's a possibility. Um, I loved Ashton Tallison. Don't make him anxious. You won't like him when he's anxious. Yeah. Uh, of course, quoting The Incredible Hulk, yeah, 70s crazy. TV show. Uh, but in a sense, it's true. He built up all the anxiety and he goes to murder bot. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think put in Ashley's head what she used later on in the episode when Chetney was losing, was affected by Ruidus. Um, also, shout out to D&D and D&D players being uh, ingrained with the notion of reduce, reuse, and recycle. It's Necromancy. <laughs> looting your friends. <laughs> Both valid. Both valid depictions. Uh, yeah, I think... Like, Fern's thievery has been sort of here and there, and been kind of, I don't even know, like a, a background gag almost, but it seems to be coming more and more to the fore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I think it's because she tried to steal from Pike. Yeah. Well, and I hadn't caught it until I made my character for the one shot we just did, but the... Wild Beyond the Witch Light, the Feywild personality traits and stuff. One of the flaws is kleptomaniac. You can't resist taking things that mm. are shiny or pretty. And Because I rolled that for my character. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. That's why Fern does what Fern does. Uh, very possible, yeah. Although she is not necessarily drawn to shiny things. Her fixation is on Things that are important to people. Yeah, but I mean, you can... But those things usually end up being shiny. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, some teleport lag happening. Yeah. 
Uh, Matt reminding them, you guys sort of woke up not that long ago in Whitestone. So it might be late now, but you actually haven't been awake very long. <laughs> yep. Time zones. Uh, I guess it's fortunate we haven't had to deal with that in any of our games. Uh, yet. Yet. Um, Although we maybe should have in the Araku one when we teleported to the whole other side of the planet. Oh, yeah. Well, but I mean, it's four time zones. So it's like going from the east to the west coast. Yeah. They're about, they're about. Anyway, uh, one of the things that surprised me, and I wanted to talk a little bit about it, is Estros' magic weapon. Yeah. Um, Matt says it's statted as a club when it's in its cane form. Yes. They can s say the word done, and it becomes a scythe he described it as. Yes. And he said it's basically a great sword. And my brain exploded. <laughs> because uh, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> Uh, I think a scythe, if you're going to flavor a weapon, like flavor a scythe as a weapon, it needs to be a polearm. Either you can use halberd or glaive. Um, and I, I... I was thinking great axe, honestly. Okay, I could accept the great hex. Um, and yeah, Rose. Because the, the motion you use with it is more like the great hex. You know, you're doing this or this with the axe. That's true. Yeah. That that's where my brain would go. Um, well, and also we don't know how long the handle is. Right. Because a proper, like, long size is the size would give you 10 foot reach. Because you're. Shh, shh. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But, either case, Chetney technically would have disadvantage wielding it. Yeah. Uh, whichever of those you reflavor it as, because they're all heavy and he's a small creature. Yeah. Until he shape changes into a werewolf. Correct. Um,. Which he hasn't been wielding weapons when he changes form. Correct. Uh, <laughs> who gets it? I think... Well, there's three people who can use it. Yeah. Chetney and Orem would both end up with disadvantage. And so, Orem, and Orem is a dex build. And sword and form. Yeah. So, he's out. Yeah. But regardless, they're the three with the proficiency. Yeah. Um, and Ashton. Yeah. Who seems to have some connection through his powers with his hammer, so. Yeah, I don't... Like, he joked about he would love to see Chetney try to wield his hammer. Yeah. Uh, which, again, gets back to Talison knows it's a heavy weapon. And... Chetney's a small creature, and it would be hilarious to watch him try to fumble around with it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Chetney does end up with it. Yeah. And the interesting thing, if Chetney does end up with it, he can be the old man with his walking stick. Yep. And then when he shape changes into the werewolf, he, he can change that to the... Yeah. And that, uh, that's my answer for you, Rose, asking who would l look best with it. Uh, the werewolf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only other person who it would fit their aesthetic would be Ladna. 
but you would have to take a feed or multi-class to have proficiency with it. Yeah, I also thought Ladna with a scythe would be like on the nose. Yeah, that, that would be the chef's kiss of looking good with it. But I don't think she's going to invest. Mm, I mean... I mean, if she had not gone packed to the chain and gone packed to the blade, I could see her bonding with it, and then it's her packed weapon, so she'd have proficiency in using it. Yeah. But she went packed to the chain. It's only a, a feat investment if she wanted it. Because yeah. you just get Weapon Master. Yeah, you get four weapons. And Warlock, she has simple weapons already. Right. So that covers the club. Correct. Uh, yeah. Um, she takes scythe, gun key. Yeah. You know. And Snoopy does make a good point. As a spell sniper, don't give her a melee weapon. <laughs> yeah, she's not a melee build. Uh, uh, even if she wasn't a spell sniper, she's not a melee build. Well, I mean, she's a five some... strength is not a melee build. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she'd have to do hexblade. She's gonna be effective. Yeah. Uh. So I'm interested to see going forward. If Matt's gonna keep t that, it's a, a great sword. Um, again, I personally would have stated it as heavy reach D10 yeah. weapon, which basically is the equivalent of a halberd or glaive, a glaive, which are exactly the same mechanically. Yeah, there's literally no difference between yeah. the two. Nope. <laughs> Yeah. It's like a spear and a trident, except one's martial and one's simple. Yeah. Without any... Well, the extra prongs make it, you know, more difficult to... <laughs> I guess... When you turn a oh, farming no. implement into no, a weapon, it I, becomes I guess, a martial weapon. The flail. I, I, I guess... I guess the main difference... Is that a spear can be used with Polar Master in the Trident Camp. <laughs> so the simple weapon is better overall. Yeah. Uh, the things that they didn't, didn't think about. Uh, they get the ship. Uh, a funny little reunion. Funny scene between Laudna and the teenage boy. Yes. She decides to make cookies while everyone's out shopping. They get some diamonds and a ruby. I have no idea what she's buying that ruby for. I don't either. I'm wondering if she's trying her hand at making a spell. Following in Caleb's footsteps. Ah. And it has something to do with Ruidus. That's why it's a ruby. Yeah. That's the only thing I can think of, because there's nothing that requires a 400 gold ruby. Um, the only things that require ruby specifically are ruby dust. Yeah. Ground, you know. Uh, and I misheard. I thought it was 40 or 50 gold, but it's 400. Yeah. So when I was looking through spells, I was like, well... Insight Greed, which she took as Jester and really enjoyed. Yeah. And Teleportation Circle is 50 gold dust of any gem dust. Yeah. That's non specific. Well, but, and she could have done, if she was doing that, she could have done the Ruby just to flavor it with Ruidus. Yeah. You know? um, but I, I think she's trying her hand at creating a spell. She's probably talked to Talison and or Liam, you know, along with Matt. Yeah. And it's got something to do with her main uh, connection. I doubt that she has talked with Talison. I think it's just Matt. Okay. 
because I think she wants to bring it out as a surprise. That That's fair. That's fair. Um, I only thought because they both have the experience with creating stuff like that, and she may have, like, bounced ideas off them. Yeah, well, I mean... Yeah. But even Sam created a spell in this campaign, so... True. Uh, I think it's interesting that Matt made her get a... Well, it seems to have required a gold cost component for whatever spell she has designed. Which I think is hilarious. Because Laura is notorious for... Vexalia, well, that's all you have to say. Vexalia. Well, and also, like, they had the, the discussion in this episode about uh, the Pearl of Power needing a power word to activate. And Laura's like, no, you don't. And Sam's like, yes, it says it right here. I have one all the campaign, too. One to one. I just said I use it. It's like, yes, but you also never narrated you using your holy symbol for anything either. But it's like even when in two, Jester complained about the price of something, and they're like, you're letting your Vex show. Yeah. Um, day four of the travel. Oh, and funny. So, day four, they are over or, um, or very near uh the city that they were just at, or near about where uh, Odahan's base is, when Ruidus flares. Hmm. No coincidence at all, I'm sure. Um, Imogen's having a dream, and sort of pleasant, and then it turns which I thought was an excellent change of pace. Yes. Uh, I think Matt wanted to get to the meat of it. And so just a, did that short, nice intro rather than letting it play out a little bit. Um, but it turns, she walks out into the storm sees a figure, flies toward it. It's her mother, presumably. Heavy, heavy uh, influences of Laudna's appearance. Yeah. With the veil, you know, the veil and cloths whipping about in the wind. Uh, I got a very strong Laudna vibe. Um... We switch to the folks awake on deck. Orem, Fern, and Chetney. Chetney fails a wisdom save and transforms. Yep. Forcing the other two to confront him. And Ashley delivers one of the big laugh lines of the night after she casts Daylight. Moon's getting real low, big guy. Yep. Another Hulk reference. Uh, and I'm wondering if the fact that she was using a Black Widow line to bring him out of it put him back in the mind that he well, needed to... Well, I think to... that's why he chose to not use Advantage. Well, and, well, the thing I'm getting at is, arguably, there's a bigger parallel, you know, between Black Widow and Hulk and Fern and Chetney than FCG and Hulk. Yeah. You know. Um, and... I thought Matt adjudicated that moment interestingly because it implies some very interesting things. 
one, if Ruidus is flaring during the day, it's not as powerful. Yeah. Um, which is a big deal. Uh, narratively, world building wise, it's important. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it, there's more. I, there's got to be more to it. But Matt allowing him to make the save. Um, because that's usually not something that would bring a werewolf out. Like Moonbeam has in the text, it forces shapeshifters out of their form, right. into their natural form. Uh, where he allowed daylight to do that. Uh, or at least allow for the possibility of, to break him out of what right. was happening. Uh... I was really tempted to do some more shitting on the Blood Hunter because how thoroughly the Battlemaster fighter was wiping the floor with him. <laughs> but I don't think it's fair because he wasn't using a lot of his Blood Hunter stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think it's fair to tear it down, but I did laugh at a little bit privately. Um, and Oram was on fire. Yeah. Uh, in that fight. Um, bit of a rules question in that battle. Oram using his shield to hit Chetney. Uh, and Matt just giving him, you know, just roll the d8, basically is what he told him. Roll your sword die. You're just flavoring it as your shield. Which is an interesting way to do that. But I would have made it an improvised weapon with a d4 damage die. Because hmm. um, even the shield master feat... Uh, the shield bash that you can do, I don't think does damage. It just pushes the person down. Yeah. Um, him using his trip attack maneuver to put him down uh, was interesting as well. Um, same effect, it's you know, but different. And arguably better, which makes me wonder... If we'll see a rework of the shield master feat. Uh, she breaks him out of Ruidus's influence, only to have Travis go, I'm below a certain number of hit points. Yep, because the Order of the Lycan. And he failed that save. Yep. And I loved Ashley's, here you go, oh no. <laughs> Uh, oh, so good. <sighs> and I felt so happy for Liam to get that eight. Yes. To add to his AC. What's your AC now? 27. What? <laughs> yeah, it's reporting. Oh, man. It's... It's weird how simple the class fighter is and how arguably like little damage it does in comparison with other classes. But I don't know. There's just something about fighters that when you're using your stuff it feels better than when you're a spellcaster, to me. Okay. Uh, and speaking of the one shot this weekend, I felt amazing the entire time. Until we got to the big bad, and the character was having a crisis of conscience, and the dice were informing that. 
and I was just like, this is great. I love it. Loved every yep. minute of it. Lo loved it. Uh, and I don't get that feeling ever. Even when I come up with a clever way to use a spell uh, that's not outside of the bounds, nor is it, strictly speaking, the text, uh, it's still, it's not the same. Like using uh, mending for malfraud. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Just to bring it full circle. Uh, or, so, uh, he, the character's an NPC, but he's traveling with uh, my daughter's party. Um, a tabaxi. Uh, tomb, Raid, uh, tomb Raider. Tomb okay. Raider. Yeah. That we designed. He has mold earth. So, he digs them earthworks as a fort, like a 60 foot diameter circle. He just digs up and basically makes, you know, it's a five foot hole here and just piles it up here. So it's a five feet down, 10 feet up, and then five feet down again. Fortification around. It's one way in and he traps it. Uh, Interesting. It's a way to, because Mold Earth, it doesn't go away. Yep. So if you need to dig in and dig yourself a fort, you can do that very, very quickly. Uh, so, because it's five feet, six seconds. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, but after Chetney is resolved, we get back to Imogen to see her mother get ripped away. Yep. And her see the moon above and stars peeking through. And she is inspired to fly up and I think Laura while having difficulty in that confrontation with Otahan getting what Matt was laying down which is rare for her because normally she's on it yeah I think she's back on it now yeah she's got the feet she had the confrontation she's beginning to understand a little more and now she's like, I'm flying up. Yeah. And then Matt says, the flare subsides. You slow down. Stop. You begin to fall. And she wakes up. First thing she does, I message my mother. Yep. Are you there? Imogen? We'll call it there. So good. Uh... So they were kind of losing their minds, and there was some, is she alive, is she dead, questioning. Yeah. Because technically, sending will work across planes. So even if she's dead and in the afterlife, yep. she could still technically get a response. There was no dice roll, so I don't think that's the case. And one of the reasons I was excited about the potential for teleportation circle, for Imogen getting it, is Rudis is on the same plane of existence. So technically, if she were to receive the sigils of a teleportation circle there, yeah. she could teleport them there. Yeah. Or if she wants their high enough level, she just gets teleportation. I look up at the moon, I teleport us there. Now, we don't know if that portion of the Divine Gate does anything to prevent that, but um, the Divine Gate doesn't prevent them from plane shifting. My, my gut will says that uh, this ship will be retrofitted to a spell jammer. Interesting. That's why they were given the ship. And these people that are studying it have a theory about. Yep. I can see that. that. That's 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 what I that's how I think they're going to get there. And Matt has often used elements out of new books released before they're released or just after yeah. in the campaign. And and if he does that, 
and we get some Spelljammer stuff happening. Uh, uh, he gets to be the first to describe Exandria from the perspective of a Spelljammer coming into their crystal sphere. Yep. To allow other people playing Spelljammer to get to Exandria. Yep. So that that's how I think they're getting in there. Because I think what's going to happen is the teleport circle or teleport won't work because of the divine gate. So otherwise it's not really keeping anybody. Well, and we know that teleportation doesn't work up in the north. But they didn't take into account spell jammers because that wasn't a thing. And that's how they bypass. Yeah. The lattice work. Interesting. Anyway, that's all for tonight, guys. We will be back here next week discussing episode 40, where I think we are nearing another level up. Yes. I think three or four episodes, depending on what happens. I think we have to meet the Gorgine, and whatever we discover at EOS, I, I think, think that's then we fair. Get then we get another level. I think that's fair. Yeah. So, until then, take care of yourselves and each other, guys. Okay?